How you doing folks? You're very welcome. We're here this morning in Bruneville Windmill. You can see it there in the background. Bruneville is just a small little town, I suppose, a small little village, just about three miles outside of Tralee. Um, you can see the windmill there in the background. We're going to go in there in a few minutes and we're going to meet a man by the name of Donald Coppinger. And Donald is the man that gives the talks and gives the the whatever. He's the, the tour guide. He um, If there's any man that knows about this windmill, it's, it's Donald. Um, which just before we go in there, we're just going to give a, a quick look around here outside and i just tell you a small bit about what goes on here, what is at the back of the windmill. Alright guys, we're just here at the back of the windmill. You can see that roadway running back along there. That was actually the Tree Dingle railway line at one time. Um, I'm not exactly too sure of the dates, but we'll figure it out. And here inside on our left hand side, this was actually the boat yard where the um, the Ginny Johnson was built. And you can see there in the background you have the, the Sleeve Mish Mountains. And if we just zoom around to our left, um, you can see there's actually a pier there. At one stage it would have been used. And way outside there in the bay, I don't know if I can zoom in enough now to see it. But I don't exactly know if it's true or false. You can see it there right in the middle of the screen if we can zoom in. And um, there's like a stick standing up. That is the bow or the stern of um, a boat that was actually owned, I'm not too sure, it was in McCowns or Latchfords in Tralee. During the time of the Civil War in Ireland, it was actually tied here to the quay in Fina, in Bruneville. And the IRA were supposedly, they cut it free because they were afraid that... Um, the, the British soldiers or the Free State soldiers or whatever at the time were going to take it and use it to transport troops or whatever. But half it is inside in the channel there and half it's outside there. That's what I was told, how true or false is or not. And then over there, um, you have the canal, of course, the, the, the main artery into Tralee for an awful long time. And here under us, inside in the mud, um, I think... Going back when they launched the Ginny Johnson, there was rumours that they found um, an old, old ship. Now, I presume it's still there. No one probably found it in the meantime. And um, or no one touched it. Because they the idea was they were going to launch the Ginny Johnson from here and launch it out into the water and sail it up to Phoenix. But for one reason or another, it didn't work out because um, they, did, they couldn't go digging and it was covered back over and it was never touched since now here's the windmill i'm not going to tell you much about the windmill only i don't know a whole pile about it only i remember when we lived back west back in our seven or eight miles back the road but i remember passing it in i suppose right up until the late 80s and it was just a bare shell um i know three county council or Kerry county council and foss um which is local training they actually restored the windmill. It was due to be knocked, um, but I suppose locals or whatever, um, they restored it. And right in front of the windmill, out by the road, there was, um, what we would call it one time, there was also a workhouse. And if I move over here to the right hand side, you can actually see back along there, that's where the old, the Dingle train would have ran. And it ran, I'd say probably from the, around the 18, Around the 1880s, right up until I think around the 1960s, or 1950s or 60s, um, it ran straight back along there. So yeah, that's kind of it. Um, we'll go into the the windmill and we'll talk to Donald. Um, I don't have a whole pile of footage, and we probably won't be able to get the windmill going today because there is zero wind. Um, there's a flag flying over there, I don't know whether you can see it or not, and it's just not moving at all. So, look, that's the windmill. I'm going to put up the drone as well. We're going to experiment with the drone. Hopefully it doesn't end up inside in the drink. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I hope you liked the video. Give a like, give a subscribe. It's something a bit different. I said we do this because we've done the, the mill in Derrymore as well a couple of weeks ago. And just in case I don't get a chance to see it inside, thanks to Donald. And thanks to all the staff here at the windmill. It's usually open if you want to call. It's open from around Easter time. Um, right up until kind of October. Kind of seven days a week. 
and after that I think it's weekends and stuff like that but you know what it's brilliant it's actually a fantastic place to bring your kids or bring the family there's the, you know it's 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 just a facility and it's right on the doorsteps of of Tralee just heading out for heading out for Dingle just across the the famous Brunaville Bridge there at one time um yeah so look see what you think give a like give a subscribe and um here's uh Donald Coppinger Rolling. Hi, my name is Donald Coppinger and you're here at Blueville Windmill. This windmill here was built in the 1790s. It's one of three to 500 water and windmills built on the east coast of Ireland during that time. So if you sent off flour over to England, you didn't have to pay taxes to the king. So there was a lot of water wheels and windmills built around Ireland. There's actually only four left. You've got Blueville here. You have one in Elfin County, Roscommon. You have one in Ballycopen County Down. And the last one is in the Scaries County, Dublin. Um, but there's a lot of water water wheels around the place and water mill water mills around the place, any place like Milltown, any place named like that, that actually had a water wheel on it. If you look up here now, you'll see that big wheel and that big chain up there. If you pull onto that chain, you can actually rotate your caps. So you can turn your sails 360 degrees, but it's 10 tonnes, roughly the weight of around 7 carats. So I'd have to get the whole Kerry football team to come over to give us a hand to rotate it. But 85% of our wind comes from the sea, so we leave her in the sea direction. So instead of me chasing the wind, I wait for the wind to come to me. So we'll go on to the next part, okay? So this here is your rotation stones. They're made out of sections of quartz and French burr and come from France. And if you see these grooves here, that is actually to get your flower to come out to your side. So you have a bed stone, you have a rotation stone, your wheat goes in between the two stones, and what these grooves are here for is for the flower to fling out to the sides. And that's what they call dressing a stone. And once you dress the stone and it hits the metal, you can't use it anymore, and that's because of a dust explosion. And I'll explain a bit more about that inside. So probably we have two different types of windmills built in the 1700s around Europe. So this one here is called your tower windmill, and that's what we have here. Our base is made out of block, and our cap rotates. Compared to this one, the post one will slightly different folks in that the whole body rotates and your base is stationary. So this section turns into the wind to this section here. 10 tons, 26 tons, seven cars to around 17 cars. And this here folks is a fantail. And what a fantail will do is direct your sails into the wind automatically as the wind blows. But that's perfect in the middle of a green field. But by the sea here, your wind will change direction very fast. So if this was on top, she'd be constantly moving. And if she's constantly moving, we can't tie her down. So the sails could start to spin and she could fly off. So that's why we have the winding wheel in the back. So our, our brake rotation, our cap rotation system is actually English. Our brake system is Flemish, Belgium, and the rest of it's from Holland. So three different ideas in one window. So, okay. So this here, my friends, is a corn stone. This stone here is actually 1,200 years old. This is a Viking stone, and we know that because of the neck. And this is actually a smaller version of what happens upstairs. So you've got a bed stone, you have a rotation stone, your wheat goes in the middle here, and as it rotates, <laughs> your flower comes out your side. As you can see, this is your whole wheat brown flower as it be made 1,200 years ago. So this is a very small version of what happens upstairs on a larger scale. And you reckon that stone is 1,200 years old? Yeah, if you look underneath it there, you can yeah. see it there. You can see the spots in it like yeah. that. So what happens is the weed get caught in here, and by the time you get to the outside, you get that lovely fluffy flower that you have there. Good. Now you see this red bar here, folks? By moving this left and right, it raises your rotation stone off your bed stone, so it's how fine or how coarse you wanted your flower. And you knew that, my friends, as it came down your sheets. Your flower comes down here for two and a half stories, you release that stone that goes into your sack. The sack of flour that my friends was taken out here onto your balcony and slid off onto your cat. So use gravity and wind as much as possible. And last but not least in this floor, as you can see your trap door, so very safe as you can see folks. Would you pull out the rope here? This thing is gone. Like that again? Yeah, yeah. So this here, my friends, is your trap doors. As you can see, they're very safe. But you pull out your rope here, it engages a friction drive, your bag of wheel can come out. So your bag of wheel can open up the trap door like so, and then it will just shut down again. But you notice that we have leather hinges down here, my friends. If you had metal hinges here, the dust in the air would stop it from opening and closing freely. So you wouldn't, with all the dust in the air, you wouldn't be able to see it. You could easily step into this area and fall down, where your leather would always close it. Now, um, you can't actually make a windmill go faster or slower. It all depends on the strength of the wind on the day. So if I wanted the windmill to go faster this day, I'd have to stop it and take back a bit of sail. If 
if I want to go faster, I have to stop it and pull out extra cells. So it all depends on the wind in the day. But can you hear? You can hear the wind this. You can see the wind is going this way and there's no canvas out and she's still turning. So what's happening is the wind is hitting this white board called the leading board. Once the wind hits that directly, it makes the windmill go around in an anti-clockwise direction and that's because of our brake system. Our brake will actually only stop the windmill going around in that direction. If she goes around in the opposite direction and you engage the brake, the windmill can catch on fire. And I'll explain why upstairs, so follow me. So this here, my friends, is called the Great Spur Wheel. This part here is made out of oak. This is your shaft made out of Douglas fir and your teeth. You have 96 teeth made out of this material, beach. Now, can you see your dovetail here? So any mm -hmm. tube that broke was easily fixed. So say this tube that broke is fixed. You take out the two dovetails in the back, pull out this tube, slot this one in, and push two dovetails into the back again. So these teeth are all interchangeable. Mm -hmm. And I'll show you why over here, so follow me. Now, as I said downstairs, we have a bedstone and we have a rotation stone. That is our bedstone there, as you can see up there, guys. This here, above that, is your rotation stone. This here, my friends, is called your stone nut. Your stone nut is connected to your rotation stone. So what's happening is the stone nut comes down by using this gear here and engages into the great spur wheel. So the timber wheel turns the metal wheel, which turns your rotation stone, grinds out your wheat, your barley into your flour, takes it down your chute here at the back, and it goes all the way down and into your sack down below. Now, one of the most dangerous things about working inside in a windmill wasn't breathing in the dust. It would hurt you over time. Your life expectancy in a windmill was only 30 years, but the most dangerous thing was actually a dust explosion. So that's why if this weed was metal, that one had to be timber. Because if they were both metal, any spark generated here could cause a dust explosion. And the problem with a windmill is there's only one way up and one way down. You're in a conjugal shape, and you have a door open underneath for lovely draft. Timber, 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 and something yeah. explosive in between. So any spark here could pull up the place. So that's why you have so many windows in a windmill compared to a lighthouse, because you couldn't work here in candlelight either. That would actually also blow up the place. So you had needed as much windows as possible in a windmill so you could have the light coming in. But none of the windows open. And one of the reasons for that is because it's such a windy area, the wind would come in, take the flower off the ground, and put it into the air and keep it in the air. So make it even harder to read. So you just needed gravity to do its own thing without blowing up the place. And last but not least, this is your red bar from down below. And what it does is move this here, your bridge tree, up and down, which moves your rotation stone from your bed stone, so it's how fine or how coarse you wanted your flower. Right, perfect. So this here uh, is your grinding floor. So your bag of wheat will come up to here, it gets thrown into this, this is your hot, and this is your wheat. So this is what your wheat looks like, it's called hard red wheat. Your wheat goes down into this, my friends, it's called your shoe. You release like so here, and then you go into the middle of your stone. This is your rotation stone, and you've seen your bedstone on your knee, grinds between your two, and your flower comes out your side. But you see this metal piece here, guys? This is called your damsel. This is connected to your rotation stone. So when your rotation stone turns, your damsel turns. When that turns, hits the side like that. So you get a constant shaking motion, pulling your grain from your hat into your shoe, and down into the center of your stone. But here at Blundeville, we would have had three stones running. So one, two, and there's a third one over there. And that's taken away due to the fact that when we have a big tour, we need the space. And this is my favorite thing in the whole place, is this is your Douglas Fir. It is 27 feet, nine meters, goes up to three floors, and comes from Clarny National Park. So originally from Canada, grown over here in Ireland. So how you get this tree to grow straight is if you plant one Douglas Fir on the ground, and if you plant four trees around it, it'll grow very straight and very fast to beat the other ones to the sunlight. Ironically, these trees hated going by the sea, but we use the mast and ships all over the world, and you can really see why. Now, go upstairs to the last brake works, and then I'll explain how this brake works. So this here, my friends, is your brake wheel. Your brake starts here, it's actually made out of elm. Your wheel here is made out of oak. This here is Douglas fir. So your brake starts here. Now, if you follow the light, the brake goes all the way around your wheel and finishes up here on top. Do you see it up there? At that point, your brake is connected to this big timber here. Now, do you see that red bar up there, folks? When you pull that rope there, that is your brake rope, that timber will go up onto the red bar and lift the brake off so she can rotate. But once it falls down, it clamps around the wheel to stop it from rotating. So if you look over here, this is how your brake wheel actually works. So take this as being your brake wheel. So take this as being your brake wheel. Your brake is connected to the wall here and goes around your wheel. So if your wheel goes this way, it starts to tighten up to stop it. But if the wheel goes this way, it starts to push it off. And because they're made out, made out of timber, if it goes the opposite direction, it won't stop it in seven seconds, and that's when your friction heat will turn into fire. So that's why your cap has to be directed straight into the wind, 
So it goes around in one direction so your brake can stop it. And that all works in this wheel here. So you can just see it out the window here, guys. See that big wheel? I showed you that at the start. So you pull the chain which moves that wheel. When you move that wheel, you move this cog right here, and that will then start to rotate your cap. So what I'm trying to say to you, my friends, is everything from my hands up here, including that very big wheel there, rotates. And it rotates, my friends, on seven wheels. And you can see them here. So this is one wheel here. So that's one wheel there. Yeah. Beautiful. Second wheel is over here, guys. Lovely. There's another one over here. That's number four there and three in the front. But 85% of our wind comes from the sea, so we leave her in the sea direction. Brilliant. Now, one last thing I want to show you how your bag of wheat comes up. So if you go over there. Thank you. Now, can you see this moving here freely, guys? So if I push it this way, you can see the chain coming up. Mm -hmm. And if I put my hand right here, nothing happens to it whatsoever. Now, this would be rotating. And I said to you at the start is, you tie your bag of wheat onto your chain, you pull your rope and your bag comes up. So look what happens here when you pull the rope. The two of these will engage. And once that's rotating and this hits it, this will then start to spin as well, which will bring your chain up, which will bring your bag of wheat up. To stop your bag of wheat from coming up, all you need to do is just let go of the rope. See the way she always wants to come out with engagement, guys. So on the ground floor, you tie your bag of wheat onto your chain, you pull onto your rope and you listen. Now remember the bang of the trap door downstairs. One, mm -hmm. two, three bangs. You move your bag of wheat who's on the floor below you, so you let go of the rope and stop the coming up any further. Brilliant. And how many tons a day, Donald, would say, would you have? If you were working, if everything was working optimally and you say it was brown, right? Holy brown flour. Yeah. Because white takes, uh, or if it was. <clears throat> How do I put it now? So white flour actually takes a shorter time than brown flour because mm -hmm. you have your two stones apart. So you want the shell to be quite big so it's easier to separate from the flour. Yeah. Brown flour will take a bit longer. But if it was everything was working perfectly, you didn't have to change the sails, you'd be doing a 50 kg bag every half hour. So you have three stones downstairs, so you'd be doing one 150 kg every half hour, 300 every hour, and in an eight hour day, that's roughly 2,400, which is around two and a half ton. Brilliant. And was it where were the wheat and uh, where would it have came from? So the came, it came from this area here. So yeah. this was like a taxism. So anyone, so when you were over here in Ireland at that time, you would have a lot of wheat would have been growing from 1730 to around 1845. Ireland was known as the breadbasket of England. Mm -hmm. So they were sending a lot of wheat over. So you would have, uh, most of your farm would have been wheat. So you could actually, for rent and for, for paying for whatnot, Mm -hmm. And then the last part of it, your small part of your farm then was used for potatoes. Mm -hmm. And that's why you were so dear. So that's why you didn't need a whole pile of land in, like, I think it's like a half a hectare acre. I think you can get two tons mm -hmm. of, of, of potatoes. So it's oh, just a little, yes. yeah. So there's a great yield in it. And the potato was very good for the Irish man because if you had the skin and all, you actually didn't need a whole lot of other vitamins. The vitamins was actually in the skin. So you didn't need to eat a lot more with it. Oh, yeah. So that's yeah, why yeah, potatoes yeah, yeah. were very dear to her heart back then. Brilliant. Brilliant. Yeah, I would say when it was, I, I remember growing up and passing in the windmill Donald, and it just being a bare shell. Yeah, so yeah. what would have happened in around 1850 it would have stopped working um, because steam came into play and there was a steam engine inside or milling inside in, in, in Tree Town mm -hmm. which would have taken over. So like today now, you felt it outside, there wasn't a whole pile of yes. wind to get the windmill going. You'd have a steam engine going by now and you'd have it working and all yeah. day long. Yeah, yeah. And that actually ruined what the windmills were about then. Um, so it went into disrepair, it actually became a piggery for a while as well. Oh, yeah. um, and then they had a steam engine running along the road here, so the T5 steam engine that was running yes. from here to Dingle. It was built in 1891, finished going front to Dingle with passengers in 1937. It actually finished with animals in 1953. So that was running across here as well. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, there was a whole lot of different things happening in this yeah. area here the whole time. Brilliant. Do you know, it, but it must have been a fantastic sight that time for the locals to see, like... Yeah, yeah, like you know, like you're even for me to this day when you get the windmill going, like yeah, the, the, like it's, the wind is outside now. I can tell you exactly it's seven yeah. miles now. Right? Yeah, yeah, seven yeah. Miles.
here. Period. Well, great. It's a video.